Amen. So hopefully that's not giving you any reverb on me there. Does that sound okay? Okay. So um, we are continuing our study through um, the statement of faith. And our next one here, which, uh, you know, we had a good run on YouTube, but it's probably going to be gone now since the, the title of it. Uh, but uh, I just put sodomite reprobate because why not? Um, but I am going to be touching on both, both the issue of uh, what the Bible teaches about sodomy but also uh, dealing with the reprobate doctrine. So I'm going to be kind of hitting these things at the same time. But let me just read to you our statement of faith. It says, We believe that sodomy, homosexuality, is a sin and an abomination which God punishes with the death penalty. So, and you may, you may say, well, why don't you put murder on there? You know, God punishes that with the death penalty. Because most people uh, don't fight with the fact that murder is worthy of death. And or that's even a sin. You know, most people would say murder is a sin. God doesn't want people to be a murderer. But today, uh, sodomy or homosexuality is viewed as if we should actually be praising it. Not even the fact that, uh, well, you know, you should just uh, uh, not worry about it or whatever. No, if you say it's a sin, then you're a bigot and you're, you know, you need to be canceled and all of that. But the Bible says that it's a sin. It's an abomination. And let's look at the, go to Leviticus chapter 18, Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 18, Leviticus 18 and verse 22, Leviticus 18 and verse 22, it says this, it says, thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind, it is abomination. So the Bible is going to be very discreet with this, okay, and the Bible says it is, it is a shame to even speak of those things which are done of them in secret, okay. So I'm not going to explain to you exactly what goes on. And I, to be honest, I don't even know exactly what goes on. I don't want to know what exactly goes on in these, uh, these filthy relationships that people have. But the Bible, you can understand what it means to, that a man lays with a woman as far as what married people do. And it's stating that men with men, this should not be the case. Okay? And then it goes go to Leviticus chapter 20, verse 13. So we see this in abomination. Well, here's the penalty for that in the Bible. Leviticus 20 and verse 13. So what I'm going to show you first is, okay, here's some Old Testament passages. Um, and you could look at Sodom and Gomorrah, where that term Sodomite even comes from, is Sodom and Gomorrah, where men were wanting to basically uh, lie with, an, with these other men, which happened to be angels, and God burned the whole city down with fire and brimstone. So that's God's view of sodomy. You know what? That's not popular in 2023, and that wasn't popular. You know that hasn't been popular in the past, you know, 10 years or so. Or, but uh, it doesn't really matter what's popular in the world. It's, it matters what does the Bible teach. What you know? What what's God's stance on this? And this is the subject that will get you canceled. This is the subject that they'll come after your jobs and they'll riot your. You know, they'll riot and they'll they'll uh, protest your church and they'll get you kicked out of your building. They'll get all this stuff. You know, because this is. Their pet, this is the world's pet, you know, sin, if you will, that they are trying to protect. And it's wickedness. It's abomination. And God destroys it with fire and brimstone. But notice in Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 13, it says, If a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. Now, what I want you to notice here, what I guess what you don't notice, is does it say anything about them getting married or caring whether they get married? doesn't say anything about that at all. And obviously, uh, it's a man and a woman to get married. I mean, that's, that's Genesis. You know, you're dealing with Genesis uh, 1 and 2 on the fact that he made them in the beginning, male and female, and they too shall be one flesh. And that is marriage between a man and a woman. That's obviously true. But, the, you know, when, you, when you're going to fight, if you're going to go against the LGBTQAARP, you know, M-I-C-K-E-Y-M-O-U-S-E, -E, you know, just add on, you know, the alphabet community. When you're going against them, as far as a biblical truth, talking about marriage isn't going to help you because there's nothing in the Bible that's talking about them getting married anyway yeah, that's right. or not getting married or that it's a sin for them to get married. No, they are an abomination, period. And the Bible says they should be put to death. Now, uh, the reason that's in our statement of faith is because in the perilous times that we live in, that is a big doctrine today. That is something that has to be preached often, unfortunately. I don't like preaching about the sodomites. It's disgusting. That whole subject's disgusting. But 
you know what? In the world that we live in, everybody is either, you know, there's a, there's a ton of, there's obviously sodomites out there, but the bigger thing is there's a bunch of sodomite sympathizers out there where there's people out there that are just on their side. They're basically fighting with them and their cause. And now we see the fruits of it that we've known from the very beginning is that they're coming after our children and that they're a bunch of pedophiles. And you're like, I can't believe you. Would you say all sodomites are pedophiles? I'll say this. They're all capable of it. And they all have the mind that would come down to that in the end. Right. And so, and, and so you, you ask any uh, just normal person out there if they, if they uh, are for pedophilia, and you're going to get the negative on that one, meaning that they're against it. And not only are they against it, but if you said, should a pedophile be put to death, they'd be like, amen, where's, the, where's, the, where's this happening? I'll be there. They'd be like, is it going to be public? Because I want to see it. I mean, that's, that's I mean, you could just look on Facebook when someone talks about a pedophile. Everybody's just like, there's memes of like nooses, ne- memes of like, like someone loading a gun, you know, the pedophile cure. Like there's, there's all kinds of stuff that's out there for that. And so obviously there's, <clears throat> when it comes to people, uh, you know, committing cold-blooded murder, people are just like, yes, he's been put to death. Now there's obviously people that'd be like, no, to the death penalty. But the Bible teaches the death penalty because there are capital crimes. And Sodomy is not only something that we should not be celebrating or, you know, promoting. It's literally a capital crime, according to the Bible. A capital crime means that they get the death penalty under two or three witnesses. And nowadays, you don't, I mean, it's not hard to find two or three witnesses. They're doing it out on the streets. They're literally committing these acts on the streets in parades, and it's just allowed by our country. So that's, you know, you say, why is that in your statement of faith? Why, why do you show that? Because I want you to know that we have no sympathy for the sodomites here. Sodomites are not allowed in this church, will never be allowed in this church. And you say, well, what if they get saved? They won't get saved, and that's the, part, that's the, part, the reprobate part of it. Amen. Sodomite reprobate. If you're a sodomite, you are rejected by God. And you had a chance to get saved before you became the animal that you are. And you're like, I can't believe you'd say the animal. Well, the Bible says brute beast. You know what that be- means? Dumb animal. They're big, dumb animals, folks. Amen. That's what they are. They're vile beasts made to be taken and destroyed, the Bible says. Now, you know, people are like, oh, you're out there. You're, saying, you're, you're advocating for people to go kill homos. No, the, the government should be doing that. Just as much as the government should be putting people to death for cold-blooded murder. I mean, the fact of the matter is, is that's not even being done. You know, people that are like psychopaths killing people, they just get on death row and sit there for 50 years. Even in states where you have the death penalty, let alone states that don't have the death penalty. So when it comes to this, let's see what the Bible says about this subject. And I'm not going to read to you Genesis, 13, or Genesis 19 or Judges 19 dealing with the, the two cases, that these horrific cases. But you can look at those stories in your own time. I'm just looking at statements that are made in the Bible, Okay. It's an abomination, and they should be put to death. And if our government was a righteous government, they would be, they would be putting them to death, just like they should be putting to death murderers and pedophiles and rapists and go down the line of things that the Bible teaches, you know, that has a death penalty. Now go to uh, Deuteronomy 23. Deuteronomy 23 and verse, uh, verse 17. Deuteronomy 23 and verse 17 So I'm going to show you some Old Testament stuff, but then I'm going to get to the New Testament. You're like, well, that's Old Testament. Yeah, because murder is okay now. You know, I, I, I know it was wrong in the Old Testament to just, like, kill somebody in cold blood, but now it's okay because we're in the New Testament. That's, that's as stupid as saying, well, homosexuality was wrong in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament it's okay. It should be celebrated. It's insanity. When the Bible actually says the same thing in the New Testament about it that the Old Testament says. Okay? But let, let's just stick in the Old Testament for a second. In Deuteronomy 23 and verse 17, it says, There shall be no whore of the daughters of Israel, nor a sodomite of the sons of Israel. Thou shalt not bring the hire of a whore or the price of a dog into the house of the Lord thy God for any vow. For even both these are abomination unto the Lord thy God. You see what the Bible did right there? It equated sodomite with dogs. You know, the argument that people say with, with, with uh, sodomites, they're like, well, you know, dogs do that. You just proved our point. 
That's literally their, their case. Well, you know, dog, it's natural. You know, dogs do it. Well, that's why the Bible calls them dogs. You're just proving the Bible again. And, yeah, dogs also eat their own vomit, eat their own excrement. Yeah, they do a lot of sick and disgusting stuff. You want to be like that? And there's a reason why they're called dogs. Now, go to, go to 1 Kings chapter 14. Let me give you a little tour de force through uh, some righteous kings and what the Bible says they did. Let's start with, well, let's just start with King Rehoboam here in, 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 in uh, chapter 14, verse 24. It's not really saying anything righteous that he did. It's just stating a fact, okay? And also show you that when we're talking about sodomites, Sodomites are still here today. They're called Sodomites because they do that which was done in Sodom. Okay? It's, a tribu- it's not like they, 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 uh, they have a nationality of Sodom, you know, like, oh, you know, I'm from Sodom. So I'm a Sodomite. Now, obviously, people that lived back then before it was destroyed would be called that, but they're called Sodomites because they do the acts in which Sodom did, which we see in Genesis chapter 19. But in... in uh, 1 Kings uh, 14 and verse 24, it says, And there were also Sodomites in the land, and they did according to all the abominations of the nations which the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. Sounds like God still doesn't like Sodomites or what they do. Go to uh, 1 Kings 22 and verse 46. I'm sorry, 1 Kings 15. Go to 1 Kings 15 first. 1 Kings 15 and verse 11. Let's look at King Asa. Let's look at first at King Asa here. And no shock here, but these are all kings of Judah that we're going to be bringing up here. If you were hearing from my king series, you know that Judah is the only one that ever usually had any righteous king. Besides Jehu, uh, pretty much all the kings of Israel were wicked and were doing that which is not right in the sight of the Lord. But in Judah, you know, you get some good ones popping up every once in a while. Well, Asa is one of those good ones. In verse 11, it says, And Asa did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord, as, da- as did David his father. And he took away the Sodomites out of the land and removed all the idols that his father had made. So, it just got done saying he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. And what did he do? He took away the Sodomites out of the land. Now, how did he do that? We don't really know. Did he put them to death or did he just cast them out and be like, go live somewhere else? And ultimately, you know, America, I don't really care what you do with them. You know, if you want to be biblical, then obviously the Bible says put them to death, but if you want to send them to Canada or across the sea or wherever you want to send them, I don't really give a rip. Be an Asa. You know, be an Asa and get rid of them. And you're like, I can't believe you'd say that. You know, I can't. I'm just reading to you what the Bible says. He did that which was right inside the Lord, and he got rid of the Sodomites. And he was the king, so obviously he had the authority to do it. And... In uh, 1 Kings chapter 22 and verse 46, 1 Kings chapter 22 and verse 46, today preachers are afraid to preach on this because they come after your jobs. They come after your living. They come after your career. They'll, they'll basically make it to where your life is miserable when it comes to even having a church because they'll just protest and they'll do all this vile stuff and then your kids have to see this vile crap out there. But you know what? The answer is not to just give up and let them, let them do what they want. That's, what, that's why it is, the, America is the way it is, because people just let it go and just gave up and just stopped preaching on it like they should. And no, we're going to preach on this because the Bible hasn't changed. The Bible's right. The world's wrong. They can put it in their pipe and smoke it. And one day, there's going to be a righteous king. His name's Jesus Christ that's going to rule and reign for a thousand years, and these laws are going to be on the books. And what a day that will be when you have righteous judgment going forth and righteous laws on the books. And you know what? We don't live in that time right now, but that doesn't mean that I'm not going to preach that we should be doing it this way. And listen, homosexuality was illegal not that long ago. Not that long ago. And in in America's history... There, there, were, there were a lot more righteous at the beginning when it came to this issue. You're like, well, we had slaves. Listen, I'm not for slavery. The Bible says that if you, if you steal a man, then you're to be put to death. So put that in your pipe and smoke it. The Bible's against slavery and what, you know, wickedness is in that when it comes to stealing somebody and selling them off to somebody else. Put them to death. But you know what? We need to, we need to get back to righteous laws and 
And listen, these, these, uh, these Republican pundits out there in these conservative podcasts that just want to tiptoe around this issue and they want to hold hands and sing kumbaya with a bunch of fags, don't claim to be some Bible-believing Christian when you do that. Because the Bible's very clear on this issue. That is an abomination. They should be put to death. And why don't you just say that you're going to go sing kumbaya with a bunch of cold-blooded murderers while you're at it? At least murder is a natural sin. Sodomy is unnatural. It's so unnatural that the normal person would puke even thinking about it. Now, in, in, uh, in 1 Kings chapter 22 and verse 46, we're dealing with Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat was a good king. And notice what it says here in verse 46. In the remnant of the Sodomites, which remained in the days of his father Asa, he took out of the land. So basically, Asa took out the Sodomites, and there were some that were stragglers that stayed, stayed there, you know. And Jehoshaphat just cleaned house. He's just like, I got rid of the rest of them, right? Go to 2 Kings 23, 2 Kings 23, and verse 7. So you see a common thread. And if you know the kings of Judah, you know, like, Ace is a good king, Jehoshaphat's a good king. And you'd be like, Hezekiah's a good king, and there's these other good kings as well. And then you know the ones that are bad, and you can go down the line with those. But do you see a common thread with a lot of these good kings? He's like, he took the Sodomites out of the land. His son, I got rid of the rest of them. Then Josiah, which is, 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 is a bit later, Josiah, who was a king that, the young king that was basically uh, heard the word of the Lord, and he rent his clothing, and he was meek and tenderhearted, and, uh, and notice what it says in verse 7 here. So 2 Kings 23 and verse 7, and he break down the houses of the Sodomites that were by the house of the Lord, where the women wove hangings for the grove. So when everybody said, you wouldn't let a Sodomite in, in, in your church? Listen, uh, Josiah tore down houses that were near the house of God that were Sodomite houses. Let alone, do you think he was letting them in the house of God? And listen, I'm not going to let pedophiles and sexual deviants into this church. We have way too many children in this church to be playing with that garbage. And when I get done with this sermon, you'll realize there's no reason for them to ever be here because there's no hope of salvation with them. They've already lost their opportunity to be saved. They are reprobate concerning the faith. They'll never be able to believe on Christ anyway now. So why would I ever have them in the church and have any t- anything to do with them? So they will never be allowed here. You're like, well, they'll shut down your church because you don't allow them to be in there. I'd rather the church be shut down by the government and we'll go meet off in a tent somewhere in some underground you know, tunnel than have a bunch of fags and pedophiles around our children. So go to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, our, our text passage here. I don't know about you, but I'm just tired of this stuff being shoved down my throat. And just the, all this garbage that the world is pushing on as if, as if it's righteousness. And I do see, I think a lot of people are waking up to it, even people that aren't fundamental Baptists, because they see that the end game is this, this pansexual, meaning like everybody, there's no age on love, and then you have that, that San Francisco men choir, or queer men choir or whatever, that came out and just said, yes, we're coming for your children. And you're like, you're just saying exactly what we knew was the truth to begin with. And then you have the drag queen story times and everything else. They're always just trying to go after the kids. And I think a lot of people are just like, you know what? We're done with you. You start coming after our kids, we're done with you. And by the way, we're done with everything else that you're for. That's what really needs to happen is that it shouldn't just be like, I'm, I'm done with you because you're coming after my kids. You should, be, you should say, I'm definitely done for you, because, done with you because you're coming after my kids. And by the way, I'm done with everything else you stand for. Because everything else they stand for is wickedness too. So Romans chapter 1 and verse 26 here. Romans chapter 1 and verse 26. Here's your, here's your New Testament on, on, uh, on homos, on the sodomites. Verse 26, it says, For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meat. So what are are we talking about here? Well, women with women and men with men. You're dealing with lesbians, you're dealing with queers, you're dealing with everything that's involved here, okay? And... When you're dealing with this is that they leave the natural use. And what you'll see with this sin is it's unnatural. 
You know what's natural? Fornication. It's a sin. You know what's natural? Adultery. It's a sin, and even that sin's punished by the death penalty. Also, you know, murder, that's a natural sin, though. This is unnatural. These are things that a normal person doesn't struggle with. You know, there, there, there's no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. And there are, there are sins that are just common to man. This is not one of those. This is unnatural. It's against nature. It's like your sin nature doesn't even, like, desire this. This is something that is, that is just basically uh, outside of that natural sinning realm that you have to be rejected by God before you can even do these things. Okay? And that's what the Bible teaches is that God gave them up unto their own vile affections. So when people say, well, God made me this way, they are right. Now, they weren't born this way okay? because no one born into this world is born a hater of God or this, 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 uh, you know, this queer person, okay? God wants everybody to get saved, and he doesn't form people. He doesn't, you know, people aren't born in this world this way. But I'll say this, God did give them over to that. Now, he's not the one that, that you know, gave them those desires, but he gave them up unto their own vile affections, okay? So ultimately, God giving them up is what caused them to be that way, Okay, but uh, keep reading there, and it says they received in their, their, themselves their rec, that recompense of their error, which was meat. You can put in, you can put in your margin there, AIDS or HIV, STDs, and all the other you know things that they got. But notice what it says in verse twenty-eight. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. And we're going to be getting into this reprobate mind. And the fact that what that means, but this is why it's called sodomite reprobate. Okay, you say, well, you know, how could you put those two together? Because they're they are together. You're reading the same passage I'm reading, right? You're dealing with men with men, and they have a reprobate mind. And it says, being filled with all unrighteousness. I want that to be very clear here. When you're dealing with sodomites, and you say, well, how could you say, you know, that they're just, you know, like they're bad, like pedophiles? Because they're filled with all unrighteousness, fornication. And by the way, that all goes to all of this, right? They're filled with all unrighteousness, all fornication, all wickedness, all covetousness, right? It's talking about all of it. And then it says uh, uh, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters. And here's the key here, haters of God. They're haters of God. Despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection. You know, if, you're under, if you like to underline in your Bible, underline that. I mean, like we were talking about, it's, it's unnatural, and it says that without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of what? Death. Not only do the same, but have pleasure in them to do them. Now, think about this. They not only do the same, knowing that it's worthy of death, okay? They have pleasure in those that do them. And think about, what do they have pleasure in doing what? All this that was just listed off here. They have pleasure in people that do that, people that murder, people that commit all these different acts and everything. They have pleasure in that, knowing that the judgment of God is death. And I've heard, I've heard preachers say, they're like, well, you know, because they want to say that this is talking about any sinner, that we're all reprobate, we're all given up unto our own vile affections. It's like, what in the world? They'll say, well, because the wages of sin is death, you know, so we're all worthy of death. Listen, all unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. So what it's talking about here is sins that are worthy of death, because we just read in Leviticus chapter 20 that that specific sin of sodomy it's punishable by death, and they know it's punishable by death, and they not only do the same, but they have pleasure in them to do it. That's what the Bible teaches. So there's your New Testament. How, how New Testament do you need to know that, hey, God feels the same way about this? Go to 2 Peter chapter 2. So let's keep going to the right. <clears throat> You're, uh, you say, well, is there one in Revelation? Well, the Bible says without our dogs. So there you go. Without our dogs, and it goes down the list of like people that are going to be in outer darkness. So dogs are sodomites. There's your sodomites in Revelation. So 
But you don't have to go. Do you really have? Does it have to be Revelation 22 before you're like it's relevant? <laughs> right? Like how far over do you need to go before you're like this is relevant now? Okay. But in Second Peter 2 and verse 16. Um, 2 Peter 2, verse 6, it says, In turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemn them with an overthrow. Notice this, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly. So you're in the New Testament, and he's saying, like, this was done so that it would be an example or an example unto those that after should live ungodly. So does it sound like, he, well, no, I'm, I, you know, that was just for then. I was just angry about it back then. No, he's in... In 2 Peter, you're in the New Testament. He's saying this is an example for those that after should live ungodly. That means it's still an example right now for those that live ungodly like these sodomites. Go to Jude 1. Jude 1 and verse 7. Jude 1 and verse 7. They're like, oh, you're homophobic. Listen, I'm not afraid. I, listen, I fear God, and I'm not going to fear what man can do unto me. But listen, I am afraid what homos will do to other people. I'm afraid of what pedophiles will do to children. Are you not? And so, listen, there, there's an idea of you know, having a you know, healthy understanding and, and the fear of God, obviously, that these things would be done around us. You know? And listen, I have, I, I, have, I have zero patience for anybody that would ever step foot in this church that would have any inclination of being some kind of pedophile or sodomite, they're not going to be in here very long, okay? You're like, oh, are you going to kill them? Listen, if I saw, listen, if I saw somebody, somebody molesting a child, they probably won't make it out of here alive. Amen. Just facts. If it's my child, they won't make it out of here alive. I'll be sure of that. And I probably won't even use a gun because they will be destroyed. But I'll say this is that I don't want it to even be a case where it even, has to even be thought about, right? Do you, want, do you want it to be a case where you have to even think about, like, this person over here, I might have to, I might have to take them out because if they, if they touch my child, then I'm going to have to do something here. How about we just eliminate that garbage? How about we just, how about we just don't have any of that in our church? Okay. And listen, if, if you don't... It, if you don't want to be thrown out for being a sodomite, don't be a sodomite, you know? <laughs> and don't act like one. Be like, well, I'm not really a sodomite. I just, I just act like one. Then you're out. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like that Jesse guy that I threw out, like, years ago. It's like, uh, and you're like, oh, there's no proof. Well, you shouldn't have acted like one. Okay, you're like, I'm actually saved, you know, and I, I'm not a sodomite. I'm not a predator. Well, you're not going to be here. And here's the thing, though. I'd rather be on the safe side with this than take any chances. And uh, so, <clears throat> you know, this is an important issue. This is a doctrinal statement. Listen, uh, homosexuality is, uh, you know, punished with the death penalty. And on top of that, uh, they, they're not, they, they can't, they're, they're, they're past hope of salvation. So what's the point of them even being here? Not to mention, we don't just have unbelievers. We don't just... Say, all oh, unbelievers, come in. This is a place for believers. We go out to the world to preach the gospel to the unsaved. And not that an unbeliever can't come in and, and obviously be in the service and all that. I'm not against that. But we're going to preach you the gospel when you get here and when you come here. You know, we want you to get saved. But my preaching is going to be to the saved, not to the lost. Okay. Now, uh, Jude 1, 7 says, Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the city of in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Now, what's a synonym for strange? Queer. Guess what? It's in their name, LGBTQ. And they call themselves that. You, know, you call them fags. Or that, that's not in the Bible. Actually, it is. Not the word. But... You know, in, in, uh, in Matthew chapter 13, where it says that he's going to take all the tares and he's going he's to bundle them together to be burned, that is the definition of a faggot. Like, that is what a faggot is, a bundle of sticks to be burned. You're like, well, it's tares and that sticks. Well, you know, semantics. But either way, you know, I'm going to use the term. Because that's what people know. When they hear that term, they're like, oh, okay. 
Some people may not be like sodomite. Listen, people don't even know about Jonah and the whale nowadays. And so when you say sodomite, they're probably like, what are you talking about? Okay? But when you say fag, they know what you're talking about. When you say queer, they know what you're talking about. And I'm not going to call them gay because, you know, gay means happy. It means joyful. It doesn't mean being a fag. Okay? Now, Philippians 3 says this. Remember, we saw in Deuteronomy 23 that uh, uh, basically sodomites are equated to dogs, right? So I want you to think about this when you see that term dogs in the New Testament. In Philippians 3, in verse 1, it says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me, indeed is not grievous, but for you it is safe. So it's safe for me to write this to you. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware, beware of the concision. Now, <clears throat> listen, I understand that when you go out soul winning, you should beware of dogs, like physical dogs, right? Don't get bit. But that's not what it's talking about here. When he's talking about dogs, he's talking about people. Who exactly are you talking about? Well, according to the Bible, a sodomite is a dog. And furthermore, in the Bible, it'll refer to reprobates as dogs or swine. And so, go to uh, Jeremiah chapter 6. Jeremiah chapter 6. So I want to segue that one. <clears throat> I'll say this. Even if you believe a sodomite can get saved, you can't deny the fact that the Bible says it's to be punished by the death penalty. I mean, my, my independent fundamental Baptist brethren out there that don't want to believe in this reprobate doctrine that I'm about to show you, you know, you have to at least say the Bible says that it's an abomination and they should be put to death. I mean, that's what it says. So, but I, here's, here's, a, here's why when, you, when it comes to this, you say, well, why? You wouldn't let them in your church? You know, don't you want them to get saved? Well, I'll say this. If someone was a sexual deviant, even if they could get saved, I wouldn't want them in the church. Period. Okay? But I'll say this. I don't have to worry about that kind of hypothetical situation because if they're a sexual deviant like this, the Bible says they can't be saved. And on the surface, you know, when I heard this doctrine, when I, when, when I, was, I heard this doctrine for the first time, I'm like, that doesn't make sense, right? On the surface, like sodomites cannot be saved because you're like, well, Jesus died for everybody, didn't he? And he did. And by the way, he died for the sodomites. He died for every single person. But here's, here's the difference. The sodomites will not believe. People come to a point, and, and it's not just, not just people that go down the trail of being a sodomite, because there's other people that are reprobate that maybe don't go that far down, or they don't go down that path, okay? But they're still haters of God. They're still reprobate, okay? But there are people that God gives up on before they die, okay? Now, obviously, people that die without Christ, they go to hell, they're given up on, they're rejected, they're gone, right? There's no hope of salvation. Would anyone here or anybody out there claim to say that when someone goes to hell, they could actually go to heaven one day? I mean, at that point, you got to say there, there's no hope, right? What the Bible teaches is that some people can come to the point before they die to where there's no hope of salvation, and they're just basically dead men walking, you probably heard that term like on death row when you'd be like dead man walking. Because they're walking, they're alive, but they're a dead man, right? I mean, it's just like as good as dead, right? And that's essentially there's people out there that are like that. Now, let's see who these people are. Go back to Romans 1. I'm sorry, you're in Genesis. You're in, you're in uh, Jeremiah 6.30, right? Jeremiah 6.30 says this. Reprobate silver shall men call them because the Lord hath rejected them. The first time reprobate is used in the Bible, it's referred to as something that's being rejected. So reprobate silver is rejected silver, if, you, if that makes sense. So like basically when you purify silver, there's tin and different things that's being, like the dross that's being rejected. So reprobate is something, something that's rejected. Now what you find out in the New Testament, when this term gets brought up, it's like an adjective, okay? Reprobate mind, reprobate concerning the faith, reprobate unto every good word. Like, it's, it's, it's basically like this. They're rejected concerning this. This is rejected, you know, when it comes to them. Because the term rejected, if you just said, you know, he's rejected from eating at Waffle House because 
I don't know, he ate too many waffles or something like that. Doesn't mean that he's, he's lost hope of salvation, right? The term rejected or reprobate is just that, right? It's just, it's just a term that could be used. But in the Bible, when it's using that term, it's talking about basically being rejected from something, okay? But in most cases, you're talking about someone that's being rejected from ever getting saved, okay? Now, let's see how this starts, okay? Because no one is born into this world being rejected by God. Contrary to Calvinist belief, okay, no one is born into this world where God just, you're damned, you're going to hell. And there's no hope of salvation for you, okay? God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He'll have all men to be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. So he wants everybody to get saved. Everybody is born into this world. Listen, baby Hitler, he wanted to get saved. He wanted him to get saved. He wanted Jeffrey Dahmer to get saved. He wanted Ted Bunny to get saved. And if you know who these people are, you know that obviously it didn't turn out well for them. But when they were born into this world, he wanted them to get saved. But there came a point in their lives and when it comes to uh, you know, psychopaths and just different people to where there was no longer hope. And Romans chapter 1 really shows us, well, one, this reprobate mind, but where did it start, right? Like what, what kicked this off? Like what caused this to happen? I don't believe God's just up there like the Calvinist. He's just like, you're rejected, you're rejected, you're rejected, and it's just by chance. He's just up there flipping coins, and it doesn't matter. No, notice what it says in verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Here's the key to understanding it. They hold the truth in unrighteousness. Are these people ignorant of the truth? No. By definition, a reprobate is not ignorant of the truth. They actually hold it in unrighteousness. Notice this in verse 19. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. So did, he, did God not show this unto them? No. He knew it. And what's, you know, it, what was just talked about, the hold the truth in unrighteousness, what were we talking about? The righteousness of God, which is revealed by faith, from faith to faith, right? The power of God unto salvation, the gospel, and then it goes on to say that there's people that hold it in unrighteousness. And it says in verse 20, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. So why was their foolish heart darkened? Why does it go on to say, Wherefore... You know, in verse 24, wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness. In verse 26, for this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. Right? And then it says in verse 28, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. So over and over again, it's, he gave them up, he gave them up, he gave them over. But what, what triggered that? Right? What triggered that event where God gives them up? Because you say, well, you can't give up on them. Are you going to give up on them? God gave up on them. Why would I be giving them any hope? I can't save them. If God won't save them and God gives up on them, then how am I supposed to give them any hope? But what caused it? Well, they knew God and they glorified him not as God. They held the truth and unrighteousness. So you're dealing with people that knew the truth and rejected it. Now, the, the biggest example of this is Pharaoh, right? I mean, uh, the biggest kind of example that it points to when it comes to being hardened, where he hardens Pharaoh's heart. And you'll see that he wasn't always hardened. There was a point where God hardened it. And when we went through Exodus, we kind of saw that progression and saw where God was hardening Pharaoh's heart and, and all of that. And uh, we see that uh, there's a reason why he does it. And this sermon isn't going to be all-inclusive because you could really get into just preaching on Pharaoh. The reason that he hardened Pharaoh's heart was for a purpose. Because you may say to yourself, like, well, why does he do it? Here, here, I'll say this. It doesn't matter why he does it. He says he does it, and you should just believe that he does it because he said he does, does it. Does that make sense? Like, sometimes you may not know why, but you should believe it because that's what the Bible teaches. Right? You know, why did he make the sky blue? I need to know why. Just know that it's blue, right? And there's certain things that, whether you know why it's that way, 
it doesn't change the fact that it is that way. The Bible says that he gives people over to a reprobate mind. That's what it says. But, you know, why, actually, he does actually explain why. Because he raised up Pharaoh and hardened his heart so that the world would see his glory and see his wonders so that many more people would be saved. So ultimately, you can see, well, why does he do it? Because ultimately, he's, he's using that in order to get more people saved. And we can't always see the bigger picture, but that's what's going on there. Now, what does it mean to have a reprobate mind? What does that mean? If you, well, what's reprobate mean? A rejected mind, okay? And what you're going to see with people that are reprobate, it has to do with their mind, right? The Bible talks about people having a seared conscience. And it talks about people that, have, that do not have natural affection or without natural affection. And go to John chapter 12, John chapter 12 and verse 39. John chapter 12, verse 39. John chapter 12, verse 39. And by the way, when you understand this doctrine, it just opens up the Bible. Because I remember when I first learned this doctrine that there are people that God basically shuts off from getting saved. And they, had, they could have been saved, but they, they rejected God and he rejected them. And then, you, then you're just like, oh, this is why he spoke to them in parables. And you're like, the whole New Testament's opened up now. This is why certain people, he's like, I don't want them to believe. I want them to be blinded. And you're just like, what in the world was that all about? You know, I remember when I first got saved, I'm like, why? What's going on here? Like, why is he speaking to them? Why is he being so cryptic to them? And in John 12, notice what it says in verse 39. Therefore, they could not believe because that Isaiah said again, he had blinded their eyes and hardened their heart that they should not see with their eyes nor understand with their heart and be converted and I should heal them. Now, you may say, well, that's, that's rough. You know, like, I can't believe that. I can't believe that, you know. I'm not the one that wrote it, okay? I'm not the one that wrote the Bible. This is God's word here. And you know what? I believe it. And when you see that, that, that passage that's brought up from Isaiah 6, that's brought up when he says, this is why I speak to them in parables. Because they cannot believe, and he's doing that so they won't believe. And it's a hard truth, but you know what? It actually opens up why he, does, why he did what he did. But then he says, but I'll reveal it unto you, right? He revealed it unto his disciples. But there were people where he, he, he would not speak to them in anything other than parables and dark sayings. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy. So I'm just going to show you places where reprobate's used, just so that you can see what, you know, if we're talking about the reprobate doctrine, then we should be looking for that term, right? You know, it makes sense to look at that. But there's other places and there's other ways that it's stated, okay? So don't think that these are the only verses on this issue, because there's many other verses that maybe don't use the term reprobate, but that same doctrine applies, okay? So... In 2 Timothy 3 and verse 1 here, it says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. So notice that a lot of times you'll see these people that are actually reprobate that look like they're godly. You know, these are your wolves in sheep's clothing that are actually wolves. I mean, they're not just unsaved. They're wolves in sheep's clothing. And they, they have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts. Notice this in verse 7. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. So what does it mean to be reprobate concerning the faith? Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. So when someone is, uh, you know, has a reprobate mind, what are we talking about? A corrupt mind that's reprobate concerning the faith. 
meaning they cannot believe. They could not believe. They're not able to come to the knowledge of the truth. So this argument is like, well, you know, what if, uh, what if a, 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 you know, a sodomite believed on Christ? They won't. You're like, well, what if they do? Well, listen, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. I mean, if he believed on Christ, he's saved. <coughs> but it's a, it's, a, it's, it's a hypothetical that doesn't exist. You've created a paradox, right? Meaning this is that the Bible says they won't believe, and you're saying, well, what if they did? It's not possible. They're not going to believe. Now, you can say, well, I think that there's some that can. Then you go have fun with that. And listen, by the way, I probably accidentally given the gospel to more sodomites than these people that are sodomite sympathizers out there in Baptist churches because, you know what, I'm not exactly going out the door. Are you a sodomite? Are you a sodomite? Are you a sodomite? Tell me whether you're a fag. And then go off and give them the gospel. You know, sometimes they don't tell you, and you're just giving them the gospel. But I'll say this. Most of the time, you don't even have to worry about that because if they are a sodomite, most of the time, they're telling you to, you know, they're saying all kinds of stuff to you that you don't want to repeat to anybody. So it's kind of the, that, that whole realm is kind of a hypothetical that doesn't exist as well. But even if they were a sodomite and they were just, you know, trying to waste your time, you know what? I let chips fall where they may. If someone will listen to the gospel and I think that they're really wanting to hear it, then I give them the gospel. You know, I'm not there to like, and, and by the way, let me, let me just say this too, because let me put this out there. There's some people that say, like, like, especially when you get into teenagers and stuff like that, especially this weird gender-bending world that we live in, there's young people and teenagers that will say, well, I'm a lesbian or I'm gay or whatever. Listen, I usually just say, hey, can I show you the gospel? Can I show you how you can be saved? Because in this world today, they say that as if it's like a badge because they want to be a part of the club. And second of all, there are people that have been abused by, by homos, that have been molested and committed acts, you know, but they weren't burned in their lust one toward another. Because I've had people say, well, you know, things were done to me or this was happened to me when I was a kid. You know, am I a reprobate? It's like, well, do you believe on Christ? Well, yeah, then you're not. <laughs> okay? Because if you, if, you, if you believe, you know, on Christ, then, I mean, you're, it's just proof that you're not. Because there's a difference between the act that's committed and actually burning in your lust one toward another with that act. Okay? I, I want to make that very clear. Okay? And there's people out there that, that worry about their salvation because of something someone else did to them, or they were like pushed into doing things that they didn't want to do, and then they're like, oh, am I a reprobate? Listen, if you believe on Christ, that proves that point, and you weren't, and you aren't, and you will never will be if you believe on Christ. So when it comes to this, I know people are going to have those arguments, well, what about this, what about that? Well, here's the thing. Let the chips fall where they may. If someone listens to the gospel, give them the gospel, and uh, you know what? Those that are flaming queers won't want to hear it anyway, so you don't have to really worry about that. So, but I'll say this, if they are reprobate, if they are actually a queer, like to the core, they're not going to get saved. They're not going to believe. I mean, that's what the Bible teaches. Now go to, uh, go to Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1. And notice what it says here in verse 15. And you'll see this is very similar language. Men of corrupt minds, reprobate concerning the faith. And you'll see that corrupt mind, reprobate mind. Notice that the mind is there. And one thing that's interesting that the world would show you nowadays is that psychopaths, people that are sociopaths, psychopaths, they've done brain scans on people that literally, it's like their conscience isn't there. Like, they've la they have lack of any empathy. Like, they'll see some gruesome pic, or some pic. Now I sound like, now I sound like some, like, kid. Oh, forgive me for that. <laughs> they see some gruesome photo, okay? And they see some gruesome photo or something that would make a normal person be like, oh, what was that? That was gross, you know? And, and you're not even saying it. You're just thinking it, right? But they'll do a brain scan on these people, and it's just like nothing's going on. They'll see people being brutal, like they've been brutally murdered or like a massacre or like just gruesome, like sick stuff, the stuff that would just look gross, where a normal person would be like, Ugh, what is that? You know, like, why am I seeing this garbage, you know? And you kind of have this like idea of like, this is not good. 
Whereas, like, with, they put it on some people that are, like, deemed psychopaths, and they'll realize they, they, they lack any sort of, like, kind of empathy between that. Like, they see that, and they're just, like, they don't care. Like, there's no, no idea. Because they're men of corrupt minds. Because their conscience has been seared with a hot iron. And the Bible says that everybody is born with a conscience, and basically their conscience has the word of, they have the law of God written on their conscience. But someone can come to the point where that law of God that's written on their conscience has been seared. It has been corrupted. And that's where you get into psychopaths, you get into like serial killers and like cannibals and, you know, pedophiles and sodomites. You know, that's what the Bible teaches on this. Now, in Titus chapter 1 and verse 15, notice what it says here. It says in verse 15, it says, Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving. Notice that. It doesn't just say unbelieving, does it? It says those that are defiled and unbelieving. Okay? Is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. Notice how that conscience is being brought up. The mind's being brought up. Notice what it says. They profess that they know God. Remember, that they have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. They profess that they know God. And that's why I always thought, you know, these people that are just like, oh, your church is wicked, and you're ashamed for the cause of Christ. It's like, well, coming from you, thanks. You know, because it really doesn't, it doesn't get, I don't give a rip what you think is for the cause of Christ. You know, these bunch of, pedo- like if a pedophile is like, oh, you're not Christ-like. Like, what would that person know about what's Christ-like? You know what I mean? But it says, they profess they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient and none to notice this. Every good work reprobate. Every good work reprobate. You're, you're saying they, they don't do anything good? <coughs> anything that they do good is for a reason. I watched this uh, interview one time of this guy that, that it's like this, this, I would say he's probably in his 20s or something like that. But he deems himself a sociopath. Now, I'm not here to tell you like the difference between sociopath and psychopath. I would just say that most people would say a sociopath is a little better than a psychopath. <laughs> okay, but they, he deems himself a socio- sociopath, and he explains how he doesn't have empathy for anything. Like meaning, like if if someone like someone's friend dies or someone's parent dies that he knows, that he literally is just trying to uh, show emotion the way he thinks it should be shown. He literally says that he's like. He's like, I, I can't feel that. I don't, I don't know how to relate to that. Like, I can't, like, so he's like, I'll just mimic what I think it should look like. But he also stated that everything he does, whether it's good for someone to do, it's for, to, to advantage himself. Okay? So here's how you understand. When it says, unto every good work reprobate, it doesn't mean that, you, oh, that, well, that sodomite, he gave me a free drink over there. You know, or that, he, he did this. Like, he opened the door for me. Like, he's not unto every good work reprobate. Everything they do is for an advantage somehow. It's all to work in their mind to get, like, advantage over you. They're building up, like, oh, he did all this good stuff. I'm going to trust him with this. Okay? It's like if they came in here and be like, well, maybe they'll trust me to look after the kids or something like that. That's how these people get into churches and you have a nursery, and they'll, they'll basically, like, build up a trust. And they'll do all these good things, and, and they'll mimic what they should be doing as far as all that goes. And then just to get in, to get an advantage on something. Whereas on the outside, you're like, that all seems good. Those are all good things. How could it be a, 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 a reprobate concerning every good work? Because all those good works that he was doing was to do some evil work over here. It was all to do that. Now, when I watched that interview, I was like, that's Titus. Like, Because I've always kind of looked at me like, how do you answer that? Because obviously there are things that you could say, well, that, that was right. That was lawful, right? What they did was lawful. They, you know, it's not like just everything they, every little thing they do is just like you know, against the law and all that. It's the fact that every good work that they do is rejected because they're doing it to get advantage. They're, getting, they're, they're doing it to serve themselves somehow with those people. And when I heard that, I was like, that's it right there. And I mean, that, 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 that whole interview with that guy had nothing to do with the Bible. No Bible verses were brought up. It had nothing to do with them being reprobate. The, the guy that was interviewing didn't think the guy was like some like reprobate that can't be saved. I mean, the, as far as I know, the guy that was interviewing wasn't a Christian at all. 
But what I observed, I'm like, that is, that is Titus chapter, chapter 1. And so reprobate unto every good work, meaning that every, everything that they do with that would be perceived as good is for a purpose, to do something evil. Okay? And the Bible also talks about, uh, you know, it'll use the term reprobates as far as, like, people, like, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5. Second Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5 says, Examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you except ye be reprobates? But I trust that ye know that ye shall know that we are not reprobates. Now I pray to God that ye do no evil. Not that we should appear approved, but that ye should do that which is honest, though we be as reprobates. You're like, what is this talking about? For we can do nothing against the truth but for the truth. Now, when you understand that the word just means rejected, meaning that we are rejected from the world, and inwardly, now, I, want, I, want to, I know this sermon can go in so many different directions, because when you're dealing with reprobates, you're dealing with, ch- with children of the devil, okay? And a lot of times in the Bible, you'll see children of the devil compared to children of God, like Cain and Abel, for example, right? Cain was the, of the wicked one. Abel was obviously a child of God. And then between children of God and children of the devil, you have just unsaved people, right? Children of disobedience, children of wrath, people that are just not saved, they're unbelievers, and they need to get saved, right? But in these two groups right here, inwardly of a, of a saved person, let's say, is there any sin? Is there any evil? Anything? I'm talking about the soul and the spirit when you get saved. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he's born of God. So when Paul is saying that we're not reprobates because we can do nothing against the truth, he's talking spiritually speaking, we can do nothing against the truth because Christ is in us. That's the whole premise here, right? Christ in you, his seed remaineth in you, and you cannot sin because you're born of God, right? The reprobate, though, inwardly, complete opposite. Inwardly, they cannot cease from sin. Inwardly, they're ravening wolves. Inwardly, they're completely reprobate from every good work. Does that make sense? So, and when he's stating this here, what you have to understand is that Paul's writing to people that know the truth, right? And so why, that's why he's giving two options. He's like, you're either reprobate, you either have Christ in you or you're reprobate. It can't be. It's kind of like a Judas situation, right? You're either saved or you're a Judas. That's basically what he's saying, right? You're either of us or you're not of us and you're antichrist, you know, kind of like First John talks about. And he's not giving them the option that they're just unsaved because they know the truth. And at this point, you know, they, they, they're beholding the truth and unrighteousness. So that's what's going on there in that passage. Now, uh, I'm not sure how much I'm going I'm, I'm running along here. So, um, uh, so in Matthew 7, and you don't have to turn there, uh, I want you to go to 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 2. Matthew 7, there's, a, there's a, a verse that's used in verse 6. It says, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. Now, let me ask you a question. When you read that verse, do you think that he's actually talking about physical dogs and physical swine and that that's what's important? Because we were all worried about you casting your pearls before swine, right? You were like, I have pearls. I want to throw them before pigs. Right? It's like a warning. I know that you like to do that. I know that's a proclivity that you have. Don't do it. Okay? It's obviously something physical to represent something that's real in, in, in a spiritual manner, right? So we know that dogs are referred to as, uh, you know, sodomites. But swine, in the Old Testament, in Proverbs, it talks about a woman that's without discretion is like a, a gold jewel in a swine's snout. Okay, so when you're talking about swine, you know, it, it, you kind of see where it's kind of referring to a woman there, and dog is referring to a guy. And so when you see dogs and swine there, he's basically kind of hitting you at both angles, right? Men and women that are basically uh, false prophets. And later on in the chapter, it gets into false prophets where you have the corrupt tree and the good tree. And again, you're dealing with children of God, children of the devil. You're not dealing with just unsaved people there. 
That's why it says that the, the corrupt tree cannot bring forth good fruit, and the good tree cannot bring forth corrupt fruit, right? So you're dealing with those two realms. You've got the children of God that inwardly, they're without sin because Christ is dwelling in you, and then over here you have the child of the devil and the children of Belial, where basically everything inside of them is evil and, and wicked and, and all that, right? Second Peter chapter 2 and verse 12. Remember I talked about them being big, dumb animals? Well, here's where you have it, okay? Uh, in verse 12 here, it says, But these, as natural brute beasts, made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things which they understand not, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption, and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness, as they that count it pleasure to ride in the daytime. Spots they are and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. And the warning here is that they're, they're among you and you need to watch out, right? Verse 14, having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin. Sound a little opposite of what the Bible says about someone that's saved inwardly, right? Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin for sin remaineth in him and he cannot sin because he's born of God. Here it's saying these people, they can't cease from sin. Then it goes on to say, in verse, uh, in verse 14 there, beguiling unstable souls and heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children, which have forsaken the right way and, and are gone astray. Notice that they've forsaken the right way. It's not like they didn't know the right way. They've forsaken it, meaning that they knew the truth and they glorified, you know, they knew God and glorified him not as God. And it's going to explain this down further in here. Okay, exactly what we're talking about. It says, uh, and following the way of uh, Balaam, the son of Bozor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but was rebuked for his iniquity, the dumb ass speaking with man's voice, forbade the man madness of the prophet. These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest, to whom the, the mist of darkness is reserved forever. These are people that are walking and, and around you, and it's basically saying they're damned. They're, they're done. Then it goes on to say in verse 18, for when they speak great swelling words of vanity, notice this, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that are clean escape from them who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption, for of whom a man is overcome, the same is he brought in bondage. Now, when you think about, this is talking about false teachers and false prophets. That's the whole premise of what this passage is talking about here. And what it's stating here is that these people are preaching a false gospel or a false gift, which is like wells without water or clouds without water. The Bible says, <laughs> boasting yourself about some false gift, it actually says in the Bible. And they're preaching this, but in the end, because they're preaching work salvation, they're just bringing bondage upon themselves. Okay, So it's this false gospel. They, they, they speak evil, the, tr the way of the truth, all of that. But notice in verse 20 here. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and, and Savior Jesus Christ, they are in, again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. And you're like, what is that talking about? Basically, it's stating here is that they, they, they had the knowledge. They knew the knowledge of Jesus Christ. But then they were entangled again and overcome, meaning that they didn't overcome the world, right? Think about this. If you're overcome then you didn't overcome, right? Because who is he that overcomes the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God, right? But then it goes on to clarify here, for it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. And what it's stating here is that it's better if you didn't even know the truth. Because, because you know the truth and rejected it, the latter end is worse with you than the beginning. And it says in verse 22, but it has happened unto them, according to the true proverb, the dog has turned to his own vomit again, and the salad is washed to her wallowing in the mire. What it's stating here is that when, when this happens, when someone's given over to a reprobate mind, it's basically saying it would have been better if you just didn't know the truth than what's happening. Because it says the wrath of God is revealed on them, you know, on, on, on those that hold the truth in unrighteousness. And meaning, like, this, this idea of them going into their own vile affections I mean, it, it's the wrath of God being put upon them that, they're allow, that he allows them to go into this vile stuff where they receive the recompense of their error, which is me. I mean, those that are sodomites and those that are in these, like, these type of lifestyles, they don't live long. 
Because the way of transgressors is hard, but how much more is it hard when you're doing these vile, unnatural things? Okay? And that's why they don't have life, uh, long lifespans, because of the, the things that they do. And so, uh, and, and Jude hits on the same thing, but instead of saying wells without water, it says in Jude, uh, Jude 12, it says, These are spots in your feast of, of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit wither it, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. There are people out there that are twice dead. Whereas Jesus said, you, are, you have made them twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. And Jesus even said that they are like sepulchers that men walk over, which do appear. You know, which, uh, which and I'm going to misquote that. But basically, it's talking about they walk over at a grave as if it didn't appear as a grave, but it is a grave. And it, 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 you think about it, he called them what? Whited sepulchers, and that you're full of dead men's bones. Do you see how, when you understand the reprobate doctrine, these things that he states, you're just like, yeah, okay. I know who he's talking to. He's talking to someone that has a reprobate mind. In them is no, you know, basically, spiritually, soul speak, speaking, they're twice dead. And they're just waiting for the body to die for them to go straight to hell, and there's no hope of them ever getting saved. See, we're dead in trespasses and sins, and when we believe on Christ, we're quickened. And our sins have been forgiven. They're, they're as far as the east is from the west. But someone that's twice dead, that's why in Hebrews chapter 6, which I'm not going to open that can't work right now, but in Hebrews chapter 6, it says that's why Jesus would have to be crucified afresh. Because then he'd have to die twice then. If you're twice dead, he has to die twice, and he's not going to. And so that, they're without hope of salvation. So, you know, sodomite reprobate, that's why I picked that, because that, that title. Because not only is it is an abomination that's worthy of the death penalty, they have no hope of salvation. So, you know, that's our stance on, on the sodomites. They'll never be allowed in this church, as long as I'm pastor anyway. And hopefully, you know, if I ever am not pastor, that whoever takes my place will have that same stance for the safety of those that are in here, because the Bible says beware of dogs. And you need to take heed to that. And beware of grievous wolves that would come in and devour the flock. Because there are wolves in sheep's clothing. And you know what? In 2023, this is something that needs to be preached. It's something that needs to be stated. And you know what? YouTube can go pound salt if they don't like the title and they take down our YouTube channel. Or, you know, anybody else there that doesn't like this message, listen, take that up with God. Because God's the one that said it. And by the way, I agree with God, just so you know. Okay? When people are like, oh, you're hiding behind the Bible. I agree with them. Because I want to have the mind of Christ. I want to have the mind of the Lord. You know, I, I believe it because it says it. And even if I didn't agree with it, I'm going to say that, that God's right. But guess what? God's right. I actually like what he has to say. Because just out of anecdotal evidence of what I've seen, it makes perfect sense. And so uh, that's what the Bible teaches on this issue. And we will be continuing through this uh, series of this, the, the statement of faith. We have a uh, a couple more. We gotta we gotta deal with the pre-trib rapture. We gotta stab that cow because we're definitely not pre-trib. And then uh, dispensationalism. So we got some fun ones coming up. I got ecumenic uh, ec ecumenicism, uh, you know, the ecumenical movement. So I gotta hit on that. I gotta stab that one too. So um, so we got some fun ones coming up here, and then uh, then we'll be done with that series. But uh, let's end with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you today. Thank you for your word. Thank you for uh, these passages. And even though it's not a fun subject to preach on, it's still the Bible teaches about it. And we need to preach it. And so much the more as we see the world accepting this and accepting these abominations. And Lord, we just pray that you would uh, uh, help us to, to reach those that, that uh, have not been given over to this reprobate mind. And Lord, we know it's the minority of people that have the reprobate mind. But Lord, we just pray that we get people saved before it ever happens. And Lord, we love you. We pray also in Jesus Christ.